Hello everyone! Last week we talked about the first Guardian, namely Elodie, and this week we're continuing the story with probably the two most known Guardians on Azeroth, Agewin and Medivh. Now I wanted to tell their stories individually to give as many details as I could, but their stories flow into one another, so I might not be able to give all the details, but let's just see how far we can go, shall we? When Elodie's time was over, he passed on his powers to the next Guardian. It's uncertain how many Guardians defended Azeroth over the years, but what we do know is that at one point, Skevel became a Guardian, and the Guardian received the honorful title of Magna, which means Protector in Dwarven. This story takes place around 882 years ago, and Magna Skevel's time was approaching, so he had to pick a new Guardian from his five apprentices. Four of these apprentices, they were men. Falric, Jonas, Manfred and Natali, while Edwin was the only female. Back then, the social standing between males and females was not the same as it is today. Usually, females were taught to be pretty, learn skills like cooking or how to use herbs for healing. Basically, they got ready for a husband, but not something as independent as learning how to be a mage. Despite that, Edwin had become Skevel's apprentice and she was the most gifted. She had managed to master the Metri scrolls, which were scrolls made by a powerful high elven mage thousands of years ago and not even the High Elves were able to master these until decades into their apprenticeships. This is the reason why Skevel recommended Agewin for being the next Guardian. The other boys, the other apprentices, they thought that this was a stupid choice. That she was good for a woman, but they were men and true mages. Even the Council said the following. It is true, an older human said with a sigh, that women are emotional and prone to excessive displays that are unbecoming of a mage. But it is also true that Agewin has the most potential of any of the youths that Skeffel has found, and we cannot afford for the Guardian to be anything less than the best, even if that means giving the position to a girl. At that, Agewin bristled. With respect, good sirs, I will be as good as a mage as any of these boys. In fact, I think I would be better, because I had to overcome so much more to get here. The boys were still not happy. One of them tried to convince the council to pick him by turning stone into gold, but his spell failed and the council had decided. Besides, the older human added, the guardian must be the vessel of the council. I suspect that a girl will be less willful and will understand the chain of command, as it were. Now, as you can imagine, this wasn't exactly a great start for the new Guardian and the Council. But nonetheless, Agewin received Skevel's powers and took his place as the new Guardian of Azeroth. Spells that used to take all her concentration now only took the briefest of thoughts and she became incredibly powerful. They informed her about her mission, of course, defending the world against the demons, and she performed her duty. One day, a demon named Smotlor took over the school in the small village of Yortas. By accident, Agewin spotted his demonic magic, stepped in, killed him and saved the children. She was then summoned by the council, who were not happy about her methods. She should have contained the demon instead of outright destroying him, so that they could use him for some information about Sargeras. Agewin couldn't believe it. What was she supposed to do? Just let the children be used? Killed even? She was fed up with the council their methods of being reactive instead of proactive. All they did was trying to react to the demonic threat while Asian believed that they should actively seek them out. The council reminded her that she was supposed to do as she was told, that the guardian was the arm of the council and that she should follow their orders. Aeswin at this point was exhausted after all that fighting and all she wanted was to get some sleep, so she asked the council if there was anything else and teleported away to the Violet Citadel. Instead of letting time take its course, Agewin decided to use her magic to keep herself from aging. The council would change over time, some would die and be replaced, even her former fellow students passed away, but Agewin didn't care about any of that. She believed the council to be a bunch of fools and she was the one who did all the work. This ego would become even bigger when she faced off against Sargeras, 500 years after she became the Guardian. In Northrend, demons were hunting dragons, and Agewin teleported to deal with them. She sent a massive bolt of power, which struck the banner carrier of the demons, the one who held the severed head of a green dragon. This drew the attention of several demons, but they were no match for Agewin's power. The leader of the group told her that she was a fool. While she had been fighting with just a few of them, many more had been summoned down below. You are an overconfident fool, screamed the demon. All have come here while you have fought these few. I know, 
said Aitwin calmly. You know, bellowed the demon with a throaty laugh. You know that you are alone in the wilderness with every demon raised against you. You know? I know, said Aitwin, and there was a smile in the voice. I know you would bring as many of your allies as possible. A guardian would be too great of a target for you to resist. And you came anyway, alone, to this forsaken place. I know, said Aitwin. But I never said I was alone. Adrian snapped her fingers and the sky suddenly darkened as if a great flock of birds had been disturbed and blocked the sun. Except they were not birds, they were dragons. Adrian had lured as many demons as possible and the demons fell right into her trap. The dragons combined with the guardian nearly wiped out all the demons present but a few of them managed to summon the avatar of Sargeras. This was not the real fully powered Sargeras since that would have taken a much larger portal with a lot more power. Nonetheless even the avatar was incredibly powerful and a few remaining dragons quickly flew away. Adrian raised both hands and unleashed a shout half curse and half prayer. A flaming rainbow of colors unseen on this world erupted from her palms, snaking upwards like a sentient strike of lightning. It struck like a dagger thrust in the center of Sargeras's chest. This attack took nearly everything that Aegwin had and it was successful as well. Even though Sargeras tried to undo her spell, he didn't succeed and his avatar was destroyed. Aegwin's trap had been more successful than even she had imagined, but what she didn't know was that this was exactly what Sargeras had planned all along. His spirit was not destroyed and he infected Aegwin's body, hiding away until the day would come where he would be able to infiltrate the council from within and destroy Azeroth's defenses against the Burning Legion. Aegwin didn't notice of course, she thought that she just defeated the leader of the Burning Legion himself, a freaking god, and this just made her more arrogant. She locked away the avatar of Sargeras within the tomb of Sargeras and protected the place with such powerful defenses that no magic from Azeroth could ever break open the tomb. After that moment, after defeating Sargeras, Aegwin resumed her duties as the Guardian while pretty much ignoring the council as much as she could. Around 107 years ago, the council had enough. They had summoned her several times already, which she ignored of course, but this time the summon was so powerful that it actually interrupted her own spellcasting. She showed up and the council told her that enough was enough. It's been 800 years since she first became the guardian and it was time to pass on her powers. Time for the council to select a new guardian. The magic she used to keep herself young was unstable, unreliable, and if she ever lost concentration, she could instantly turn to a real age and her powers would be lost. For once, she agreed with the council's suggestion, but she wasn't about to hand over the powers back to the council. As a final act of defiance, she told them that she would be the one to select a new guardian. She traveled to Stormwind to the home of Nilas Aran, and Nilas was a very powerful mage who served the current king of Stormwind, Landon Rin. He was also not tied to the council of Teresval, which made him the perfect candidate to father her child. She let him believe that he was able to seduce her, tame the wild guardian, while in truth she was the one using him. But if you weren't impressed, said Nilas, his mind wrapping around what Adrian was saying, if you didn't want me, then why did we... Aegwin provided the answer. I came to Stormwind for one thing I could not provide for myself. A suitable father to my heir. Yes, Nilas Aran, you can tell your fellow mages in the Order that you managed to bet the great and mighty guardian. But you will also have to tell them that you provided me with a way of passing on my power without the Order having any further say in it. And take this solace of all the mages, wizards, conjurers and sorcerers, you were the one with the most potential. Your seed will protect and strengthen my child and make him the vessel for my power. And when he is born and weaned, you will even raise him here, for I know he will follow my path. And even the Order would not want to miss that opportunity to influence him. And so the next guardian was created, namely Medivh, which means keeper of secrets in High Elven. Adrian placed the powers inside of him and left him with Nilas Aran so he could raise him and teach him. For his own protection, she stayed out of Medivh's life in case her enemies would find out that he was her child. Little did she know that the true enemy in this case was her own arrogance. In her desire to poke in the council's eye just one more time, 
she had created a vessel in which the spirit of Sargeras could manifest. The perfect pawn which could infiltrate the council and weaken Azeroth's defenses against the Burning Legion. Medivh grew up, together with Anduin Lothar and future King of Stormwind, Lane Rin. His powers, as well as Sargeras, lay dormant within him until he came of age. His powers unleashed abruptly and Sargeras awakened within him. His father tried to help him, but in the end he died and Medivh was in a coma for 20 years. We later find the spirit of Aran in Karazhan and apparently he's been tortured probably by Medivh or by Sargeras. We're not sure, but somehow his spirit ended up in Karazhan. Please, no more! My son, he's gone mad! I'll not be tortured again! At last, the nightmare is over! Enduin Lothar watched over Medivh, and one day Medivh just woke up again and resumed his life. Not all the details about what he did in the time period are clear, but what we do know is that Medivh took up residence within the Tower of Karazhan, all the while battling with Sargeras inside of him, and slowly but surely, Sargeras managed to take him over. Around that time, the orcs' homeworld of Drenor was corrupted, and Kil Jaden had left them to their fates. These orcs were perfect for Sargeras' plan, since they could keep the world busy and weaken it so that the Burning Legion could come and conquer the planet. He contacted Gul'dan and told him about Azeroth, a world with water, food, plenty of things to kill, and he also told him that he would be rewarded with power. Power waiting for him within the tomb of Sargeras. Remember that Adrian protected the tomb with magic from Azeroth. No magic on Azeroth could ever open the tomb. Gul'dan was from Drenor, and so his magic would be able to. The pact was made. Gul'dan and his orcs built the dark portal on Drenor, while Medivh made the portal on Azeroth and unleashed the orcs upon the world. Aegwyn found out about this and she paid a visit to her son in Karazhan. There are two versions of this encounter that describe what happened and they both tell it in a different way. But the essence is that Medivh had killed the council and she figured out that Sargeras was inside her son. That she had been an arrogant fool and instead of doing better than the council, she actually had opened a way for the demons to take over Azeroth. She weeped in that moment. She didn't weep when her parents had died or when Medivh was born, but in that moment she cried and she wanted to die. In the novel Cycle of Hatred, she used her own magic to teleport herself away. This magic came from the spell that kept her young and while she teleported, this also aged her a little. In The Last Guardian, Medivh himself teleports her away since Sargeras is unable to actually kill her. Some part of Medivh prevents him from doing so, but either way, he didn't give her the sweet release of death and she would have to live with the knowledge of what she had done. The blue dragon, Arcanagos, also paid a visit to Karazhan, warning Medivh that he was attracting the attention of powers beyond his understanding and that a dark power wanted to use him. Medivh didn't listen, or perhaps Sargeras didn't care, Either way, he struck Arcanagus with such a spell so powerful that it burned him from within. Burned him and later turned him into Nightbane. This took so much power that Medivh had to go and rest. The Dark Riders, a group of mounted horsemen roaming the land in search of powerful artifacts, were also created by Medivh. They used to be merchants, foolish enough to try and sell fake magical artifacts to Medivh. You don't want to mess with a guardian, especially one affected by Sargeras, and as punishment he turned them into the Dark Riders. Now they're forced to collect real artifacts and bring them back to Karazhan. Now back to the main story, sometime after Medivh opened the Dark Portal, a young mage named Ketgar which means trust in Dwarven, is sent from Dalaran to become Medivh's apprentice. There have been several potential apprentices before, but most of them didn't last long, either because of the visions within the tower or because of Medivh himself. Medivh was rather eccentric. At one moment he could be as calm as day, the next moment it would almost seem as if a storm was raging within him. Khadgar didn't immediately start out as an apprentice, he first became Medivh's assistant and he was charged with cleaning up the library. Medivh immediately recognized him for what he was, a spy sent by the mages of the Kirin Tor to learn more about Medivh and the knowledge that he had. He didn't care about this, he was forthright about this, all open about it. He didn't care, not one bit, and he was willing to share all his information with Khadgar as long as Khadgar would first show him what he was sending away. Khadgar would eventually reach apprentice status and Medivh trained him in the ways of magic, turning him into a very skilled mage. More orcs were pouring through the dark portal every day, several mages were murdered, 
and Enduin Lofar tried to get information out of Khadgar about Medivh. Lofar was Medivh's childhood friend and he had seen him fall into a coma. He was worried that Medivh might fall again and he wanted to know what Khadgar thought about his teacher. Khadgar felt so loyal to Medivh and didn't tell Lofar all the details, but he promised him that if anything would come up, he would tell him. In the meantime, Khadgar was practicing his magic and he was trying to summon the visions within the Tower of Karazhan. He had already received a couple of visions by accident. One of them showed an old man leading human troops on a planet with a red sky. No one in this vision could actually see Khadgar except for that one old man. They locked eyes and what he saw disturbed him greatly, for the old man's eyes were his eyes. Another accidental vision showed him Lofar, Medivh and Lane in a forest. Trolls attacked their party and they defended themselves with weapons and magic. At the end of the vision, Medivh collapses and he says not to Lofar, not to Lane, but he says specifically to Gedgar, watch out for me. This got him very curious about these visions and he even talked with Medivh about them and Medivh told them that these visions come and go. That not all visions should be trusted, although up to this point, all visions have become a reality. This got him so curious that Khadgar started to work on a spell that would allow him to control them instead of seeing them randomly. In the meantime, the Orcish Horde had sent an emissary to talk with Medivh, to spy on him even, Gorona half Orkan. Khadgar didn't trust her at first, since she was an orc, but later they would battle the demon together you can't help but become friends with someone who's willing to fight with you. They also talked about Medivh, his trust in them, while also being so eccentric. They talked about the Horde, the portal that led them into Azeroth, Gul'dan, and that Garona was indeed a spy, but that she no longer wanted to betray Medivh because of his trust in her. She felt so conflicted about who to report to, and Medivh was so open with her, that she no longer wanted to betray him. Later we'll find out that there was even more going on between Garona and Medivh, but that's for next video. Either way, Garona was the one who came up with a plan to use Khadgar's vision spell and try to find out who opened the dark portal for the Horde. As they summoned the vision, they saw the following. Gul'dan was up on his knees, his hands clasped before him. I shall do so, for yours in power most supreme. But who are you truly? And how will we reach this world? The figure raised his hands to his hood and Khadgar shook his head. He didn't want to see it. He knew, but he did not want to see it. A deeply lined face, graying brows, green eyes that sparkled with hidden knowledge and something dangerous. Next to him, Corona let out a gasp. I am the guardian, said Medivh to the orc warlock. I will open the way for you. I will smash the cycle and be free. The time has come. Gul'dan, order your warlocks to double their efforts. Moments from now, the gateway will open, and your horde will be released upon this ripe, unsuspecting world. What they saw in that vision shocked them to their core. Medivh himself allowed the horde entry into the world. The real Medivh showed up, and Garona noticed two shadows behind him. Two shadows, one of Medivh and one of the real evil within him, Sargeras. They had to escape the tower and get some help, so Khadgar summoned a vision of the one who had battled this beast before, and the rooms changed around them, showing the moment where Adrian confronted her son and simply asked him why. Medivh, the real Medivh, was mesmerized by this vision, and they used this momentum to escape the tower, find Enduin Lofar, and return to Karazhan to stop the corrupted guardian. To stop the one who had allowed the orcs into Azeroth, who had murdered mages who were onto him, who had murdered the council itself. As they made their way into Karazhan, they found a hidden entrance leading down. They found out that there was an area beneath the tower which was the opposite to the tower above the grounds. Where above you would find a library, down below you would find a torture chamber. It was almost as if the tower reflected the two sides of Medivh himself. They found Medivh at the very bottom and they confronted him with what he had done. In that battle, Medivh attacked Khadgar and literally sucked the life out of him, making him look like the old man from the vision. He also touched Corona, transferring his emotions to her mind, his own divisions and doubts, which made her scream in torment and knocked her out for the rest of the fight. Lofar stepped up, attacking the mage with his blade and Medivh set his clothes on fire, claiming that it just got easier. In that moment of distraction, Khadgar was able to get close enough and he stabbed Medivh through the heart. In his final moments, Medivh said, Thank you, 
I fought it for as long as I could. Then the master's mage face began to transform. The beard turning fully to flame, the horn sprouting from his brow. With the death of Medivh, Sargeras finally came fully to the surface. But before he could, Lothar raised his blade and chopped off his head. With that, Sargeras and Medivh were defeated. They buried his corpse outside of Karazhan and made their way to Stormwind, where Corona would become an advisor of the king and eventually betray him, just like she had seen in the final vision from Karazhan. Garona would disappear, Stormwind would fall, the people would evacuate to Lordaeron, and Lothar and Khadgar would warn the world of the Orcish invasion. Before I end this video, let me just make sure that I've told their stories right. Aegewyn was arrogant. She herself said this, but it's also very understandable why she did what she did. Imagine growing up in a world that doesn't recognize your talents just because of your gender. Even the council itself denied her equal opportunities and just told her to shut up and do what they said. This would lead to a fracture between the Guardian and the Council and eventually Medivh's corruption. Medivh didn't really have a choice in what he did. The powers and the responsibility of the world were on his shoulders at birth. Combine that with trying to battle a titan spirit within yourself, I'm amazed that he held him back as long as he could. He even managed to manipulate events, create moments where he was himself, place good people around himself who would not hesitate to take him out and save the world. Which brings us to the end of this video, but not the end of the story. Aegewyn is still out there somewhere, the world is without a guardian, and the Burning Legion still wants to take over the world. The guardian would return not once, but twice, but that's the story for next week. For now, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, and until next time guys, see ya!